Hello. I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, thank Alexi for inviting me here. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, machine learning and mobile. Uh, at a high level, we'll look at this problem through the uh, specific problem of image uh, classification or recognition on mobile and edge devices. Uh, we'll review the current state of the art for this field. Then we'll sort of zoom out, look at where things are going, and then I'll sort of do a demo to try and tie these concepts together. And at the end, we'll do a quick recap. Um, what is the edge? I think phones are a really good example of this. Uh, it's something everybody has in their pocket, more or less. Uh, but I think of it more broadly than that. Any really, any, any moving computing platform, we'll say. So I like autonomous cars as kind of an example. But really, any sort of sensor out in the real world is sort of what I think to be part of the edge. We might even think of like a satellite up in space as being able, you know, some remote server that we can ping. So fundamentally then, I think we, whenever we deal with edge devices, we have the following assumptions. Uh, fundamentally, our compute power is significantly less than the cloud. Uh, fundamentally, our bandwidth is limited at best and usually unreliable. We might only be able to talk to a server once a day, and it might be on a random schedule, such as when a person pulls a phone out of their pocket. Uh, in general, we have to be very efficient with our power. We can't run things at 100%. And generally speaking, we need to make decisions quickly. We have some sort of concept of bounded or interactive decision time. So to use the example of a self-driving car, your car is at an intersection, it has to pick a direction to go. It can't consult an oracle. So given these limitations, uh, why do we do stuff on edge devices? Uh, people talk about like security or privacy or things like that, but I think they're kind of like walking past uh, what they really should be saying. So we take ResNet or ImageNet or any of the other classical computer vision networks, their input is a small swatch that's 224 by 224 pixels. Uh, last year, Google published a paper called G-Pipe, where by using sort of a cloud supercomputer, they were able to get this input size up to almost 500 by 500 pixels wide. Meanwhile, the latest generation of iPhones generates 4K video at 60 frames a second. So to me then, why do we do stuff on the edge? The answer is very simple. That's where the data is. Uh, people talk in machine learning about how data is everything. You gotta have the data. So in theory, working on edge devices, we have access to an order of magnitude more data than the cloud people do. And by extension, we should be able to do things that they can only dream about. Um, so first, we'll go through sort of the existing solutions in the field. Uh, CoreML, this came out of Apple a couple years ago. Um, they've worked very hard on this. Uh, iOS 13 came out last month, and uh, CoreML 3 is a very solid update to this whole platform. Uh, they have a Python tool called CoreML Tools that lets you export models from XGBoost, Scikit-Learn, and Keras. Uh, then Apple has this other set of tools that a lot of people have not seen called TuriCreate. Basically, it's sort of taking the concepts of these above packages and throwing NumPy into there, and then they're sort of rewriting them all into a package that runs on top of Metal, which is Apple's uh, graphic programming language. Uh, the basic limitation of CoreML is very simple. It's iOS only. Uh, the flip side, though, is that Apple has spent a lot of time optimizing it, and so it runs really fast. So if you're new to this whole field and uh, you have a little bit of swift experience, I think this is the best place to get started. I did a, a talk a couple years ago on how to uh, build CoreML models just using MNIST and Keras as a basic example. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing how that approach works, uh, you can look at that. Uh, TensorFlow Lite. Uh, if cross-platform compatibility is your biggest issue, uh, then this is what you should look at. Uh, they have libraries for iOS, Android, uh, they have like a Raspberry Pi library, and in theory you can get it working on pretty much anything you would like. 
At a high level, the process of building a TensorFlow light model. So we start off with some sort of TensorFlow model in that world. We have our graph definition. And then we try to convert our graph into TensorFlow light operations. If there's a one to one correlation between uh, your TensorFlow model and TensorFlow light, then this process is easy. If not, then you're going to probably have to start making some trade offs and start looking at the actual uh, you know, neural network operands themselves. Uh, I was going to demo, I was going to run one of the uh, TensorFlow light demos here, but the, uh, my X code is acting up, so I'll save it for the end. Uh, but basically, uh, we have the uh, video feed off the phone, and we have the mobile net uh, computer vision network from a couple years ago just running on the device. Uh, last month, uh, PyTorch came out with version 1.3, uh, where they have now finally added uh, iOS and Android libraries that you can run yourself. Uh, so at a high level, you take your PyTorch model, you run a JIT trace on it, it produces this .pt model, and then you can run this PT model on device using uh, the local libraries. Uh, I've not played with this a whole bunch, but I, I got it working and I was really impressed with the speed and stuff. So if you're over in the land of PyTorch, I would definitely uh, recommend that you do this. So we're just running a simple image classification network on the phone, uh, the standard thousand uh, image net categories, uh, but the speed is really impressive. So 30 milliseconds and this is a pretty old phone. Uh, this is less of the world of phones, but embedded Linux should always be on your radar. Basically at a high level, uh, you can bring whatever hardware you want and then run whatever software you need. Um, this is nice for a lot of reasons. Uh, the simplest is that like you can very, you know, if you have specific uh, RAM or CPU requirements, basically you can make the device, uh, speed up the device to be fast enough to do whatever you need. Uh, open CV, if you're gonna give me one computer vision trick, I would say just being able to type import open CV is a really good one. Uh, there's basically everything under the sun is in there. Uh, people have made all these various libraries, Dlib, I've still seen people compiling MATLAB down to custom C++ stuff, and basically you can run whatever shims or whatever you need to do on device. Um, in general, I often use this as a prototyping platform. I'll write a demo or something or other and say four to five hundred lines of Python, you know, make sure I have a high level understanding of the problem, and then I'll start to think about how to actually get it to run on the phone. A lot of times you sort of have two problems, which is one is can we do this, and then two is how do we make this fast, and oftentimes figuring out the can we do this part uh, will allow you to either uh, simplify your life significantly because you can avoid going down false paths. Uh, and then finally, more and more custom hardware is starting to come to market now. Uh, people are able to target, say, arbitrary integer and floating point depths. Uh, there's custom ASICs and Macs coming to the floor, to the market. Uh, we might even view Google's uh, quantum computing announcement from last month as sort of seeing the dawn of probabilistic pro processors starting to become a reality. Uh, a lot of people in this space, I think, have a mentality that if they can build the fastest chip or whatever, uh, that developers will flock to their platform. And I, I don't think that that's what's going to happen. I think fundamentally, on day one, whatever new, cool new hardware you bring to market, you need to have a way for people to get their existing workflows and patterns onto your device. So to me, while this hardware is cool, it's just really exposing the new limit, which is software. Uh, so here's a picture here, uh, just sort of illustrating sort of the differences between, say, these CPU, GPU, and TPU style devices. Uh, I thought this caption was hilarious because it says, uh, CPUs, GPUs, and TPUs have different ARM memory, memory architectures and compute primitives. This divergence must be addressed when generating optimized code. <laughs> like, there it is. That's all it is. <laughs> uh, so now let's sort of look at the whole software piece. Uh, here's where TensorFlow is at today. Uh, we have various high level languages of Swift. Swift, Swift is just one. Uh, we generate a graph of some form. And then we have these various, we'll say, routes to get your model out and actually run it onto some sort of device. 
Um, this is just sort of me speculating. We'll say that uh, if you look at the star right here, it's my belief that Google's long-term vision is to sort of get everything to go through this LLVM ecosystem. So uh, TPUs will have some sort of LV LLVM thing to generate code for them. TF Lite will have some sort of LLV code to generate that. Uh, we could maybe even think of WebGL as being a potential output of the LLVM uh, runtime. I think in the short term, this is going to be a painful transition because they're going to have to basically redo years worth of work to get here. But I think long term, uh, this will make the whole TensorFlow ecosystem extremely flexible and uh, they'll be able to work with whatever new, whatever new devices come to the market. Uh, so take a look at this grappler thing up here uh, because that's what we're going to look at next. Um, so grappler is a tool to sort of speed up uh, run times. Uh, this is a couple of pictures just sort of illustrating how it works at a high level. Uh, we have sort of these data conversion steps at a high level that are needed at the graph. Uh, Grappler basically then looks at the graph as a collective whole, sort of does like a minimum spanning tree style approach, and then ultimately it produces this simpler graph over here. Uh, the practical upshot of this then is that things run much faster. So we'll s think of this sort of as being like a high level, uh, top down style approach. On the other end, if you go down to the LLVM level, you'll have sort of like uh, you're trying to align your memory hits, right? A lot of this machine learning stuff isn't really so much compute bound as it is bandwidth bound. So if the compiler can sort of make sure that the data is getting there on time, it can speed up the results significantly. So we might think of this as being a bottom up style approach. And so then, we might try to meet in the middle somehow and we end up with like polyhedral compiler techniques. Uh, I talked a little bit about this last year as sort of like a here's something for them to implement uh, but I, I was kind of underselling how hard of a problem this is. I think we could literally be spending a decade on this particular slide here and uh, this is very much a hard unsolved problem. Um, so there's other people in this field looking at this stuff. I talked a little bit about like Gantt charts last year. So I like this picture which came out of the Glow compiler paper. Uh, but effectively they're sort of taking the graph as a whole and then using it to optimize the runtime to just sort of figure out what order to schedule things. Uh, so I think this is just an interesting high level style approach. Uh, to continue that thread though, uh, we think of scheduling at a high level graph level uh, but it's also very important to be able to schedule things on the device level. Uh, this is from the mesh TensorFlow paper uh, which came out last fall. Uh, basically they're exposing these sort of GPU primitives to the programmer so that the programmer can sort of manually manage where their code's actually running. Uh, this is a powerful approach because it allows you to scale up your code to large clusters uh, but the flip side is sort of you're making the uh, programmer do the work that the compiler in theory should be able to do. Uh, so to continue that thread, uh, so people are experimenting with using uh, evolutionary algorithms in order to sort of find the optimal, uh, uh, optimal layout or optimal layout of where the graphs are running on device. Uh, so this is from a paper where they were using reinforcement learning to try and split up things across four GPUs. Um, the upshot of the paper was loosely that the uh, human expert, the domain expert, uh, realized that they could sort of put everything onto GPU 3, we'll say here, and that actually ran better. Um, and so, but to me this is sort of like a, a, not a limitation of the reinforcement learning, it's just that perhaps the reinforcement learning isn't being given a fair shake here. Um, I could imagine a scenario in which we told the reinforcement algorithm that the only rule it had was that each compiler has to be doing something uh, different. And so it could figure out the same uh, end result. Uh, and so this whole area of compiler exploration or sort of using machine learning to speed up machine learning is very interesting to me in general. Uh, here's a couple of graphs from the TVM paper. 
uh, which came out last year. Um, so effectively, they're running this thing like 500 times, we'll say, in order to start producing significant speedups. Uh, for a one-off problem, this is probably overkill, and you wouldn't want to do this. Uh, but if you're doing large uh, machine learning jobs and stuff, and you have a very static problem, then it would be well worth it to spend this sort of time and let the compiler figure out a way to get your code to run 50% faster for effectively uh, free or the cost of uh, testing, running a bunch of tests. Uh, this second graph is a roof line plot. Uh, the basic idea is that this thick blue line is the theoretical maximum performance of this uh, particular video card, um, which was a Titan X, I believe. Um, so the basic thing that this roof line plot is showing you is basically that this ResNet 18 architecture is fitting neatly into both memory and compute onto this device. It's not going, it's not hitting the roof, so to speak. Uh, the flip side of this, though, is that you can see all this sort of white space uh, between our uh, ResNet operands and the actual roof, which is to say that it's not running it optimally. So here's an area where you can see where the evolutionary algorithms, sort of these like uh, efficient net style approaches, are able to more, uh, able to sort of bend pack the uh, problem into these little holes and by extension uh, get optimized runtimes. The second part of this though is that as the future, uh, this roof is basically going to move, right? It's going to go up and to the uh, left. And so the run times that we have today, the networks that we're using today, you know, we don't think of ResNet as being like a, a, uh, a well, sorry, uh, the, the run times we're running today are just going to change over time. And so the assumptions of the popular networks today, that assumption may not hold tomorrow. So at a high level, uh, the, we don't know what the future is going to look like is basically what I'm trying to say. And so then, um, I don't really know what the future will look like, but I think that if you can sort of have everything in one programming language, whatever that programming language is, you'll be able to uh, adapt to it, so to speak. Uh, so here's a picture from the MLIR uh, demos that are in the toy AST things. Uh, but you might think of being able to do whatever domain-specific language you would like to have. You get it into MLIR, at which point we can start adding all sorts of optimizations on top. And then finally, we can output it to whatever device we need. So to me, this is uh, where things are going. Uh, so now we'll try to get out of the realm of theory and into something a little bit more uh, practical, so to speak. Um, last year, I did a presentation on Swift for TensorFlow, and I did a CIFAR demo uh, that notably had no Swift or TensorFlow in it. Uh, so my goal for this year was to uh, sort of actually use this tool to sort of uh, do this stuff on device. Uh, so the demo we're going to do is we'll use Swift to build and train a CIFAR network, and then we'll actually run it on a device, that is to say, my phone up here. Um, however, in order to do so, uh, we're going to have to jump through a few hoops. Uh, at a high level, uh, we'll train a, we'll use Swift for TensorFlow to train a CIFAR model. Uh, from there, we use Swift for TensorFlow's NumPy bridge to sort of export our model to Keras, where we can then save it out as an H5 file. Uh, from there, we can load our H5 file into a TensorFlow session and freeze the graph and save it out as a protobuf. Uh, from there, then, we can convert our protobuf using MLIR into a TF Lite file. And then finally, we can run the TF Lite file on device. So at a high level, I'll demo how we get from Swift to Keras, uh, H5 to protobuf, protobuf to MLIR to TF Lite, and then finally the modifications needed to actually run it on device. Uh, here's my CIFAR model. Uh, if you've not seen any Swift, uh, this is how the, you would do a simple convolutional neural network in it. Uh, this is just a basic sort of VGG-esque style architecture. 
we have two layers of three by three convolutions, a max pool, another two layers of three by three convolutions, a max pool, two densely connected layers, and then finally a categorization layer at the end. <laughs> um, there's a little bit of magic here, we'll say. Um, basically, at a high level, Swift for TensorFlow uh, doesn't support saving models right now, so we're sort of manually adding it ourselves. Uh, Swift for TensorFlow has a Python bridge, so any Python trick is in theory available to us. So our first line is pretty simple, import Keras. Uh, the first top half of this, basically we're constructing an identical Keras model to the one we built in Swift, and then in the second half, we're just manually setting the weights of that Keras model uh, based on the results of our uh, Swift run. And then finally at the end, the magic happens, uh, this little model.save call. Uh, from there, uh, we can load our uh, H5 file uh, into the tensorflow.keras importer and then just uh, combine the variables in the graph together. This is called freezing the graph. And then we can save out the result as a protobuf. Uh, so uh, at the top is just sort of the high level TensorFlow code. To do this, at the bottom is the uh, just basically A to B to C. Uh, this is probably not a trick you have seen, uh, but MLIR is not very the is, is not theoretical right now. You can actually build and download it today. Uh, if you go to the TensorFlow uh, source repository and run Bazel on this first line. Uh, this will give you the actual MLIR runtimes. Uh, from there, basically, then uh, we have this command line tool. That's what the second line is here. Uh, we have to do some bookkeeping for our network. So we sort of manually specify some uh, input and output layers and stuff like that. And then finally, at the end, uh, we export a TF Lite file. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, I'm doing all this on top of the uh, uh, custom CIFAR demo from the Swift models repository. Um, I just basically replaced their model file with my own. Um, and then I also removed the uh, normalization step from the data. Uh, so. Uh, so then, finally, um, what I have here is simply the TensorFlow Lite image classification demo uh, from their source code examples. And I've just made the following modifications. Uh, we put our file in here. I manually made my own little CFAR labels file right here. Uh, uh, we did these, I simply just point the model reading code to point to my file. Uh, we changed the input and width and height of our Im image input to be 32 to match our CIFAR model. Um, and then finally, I added this ugly little line right here, uh, which will print out uh, the results to the console of what the network is seeing. So, Uh, we have here a picture of a dog. Uh, so we're now running our CFAR model on device. It's spitting out the results in the console here, as you can see. Uh, so now I'll hold it up to this dog picture, and it should say dog. So it's saying dog with... 70 to 80 percent uh, accuracy. Okay, so to recap, our goal was to explore image recognition on edge devices. I showed you the current high level approaches in the field. I talked about how I think hardware and software is going to get closer together in the future. And then finally, I demonstrated using Swift and MLIR in order to build a TF Lite model, which we then ran on device. 
Um, so that's about all I have for content. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, MLIR team. They've been working very hard on this all summer. Uh, the Swift for TensorFlow team has been making uh, steady progress for the last few months as well. I've not demoed any fast AI tricks, but there's a new version of library that's due to come out shortly, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I'd like to thank two people in particular. Uh, Mio Rosendorf, this is a gentleman over in South Africa. He wrote a really nice blog post on how to do this NumPy bridge with Swift for TensorFlow, and I really found that useful, so I wanted to thank him. And then a gentleman over in Taiwan named Kon Sin Tan, uh, he's done a number of interesting technical presentations. Uh, but he did one on uh, MLIR and TensorFlow uh, earlier this summer, which is what uh, made me realize that doing things this way was even possible. So thank you to him. Um, if you're interested more in this subject, uh, there were a number of interesting presentations at the LLVM Congress earlier this year. If you're interested in polyhedral uh, uh, compilation techniques, um, I stole a number of sli today's slides from uh, this presentation by Albert Cohen. Uh, but you should look at some more of his uh, uh, papers and stuff. He's been working in this field for almost a decade or more than a decade. Um, and then finally, LLVM is not the only uh, game in town. And so I think there's some interesting stuff going on in TVM and Glow as well. It's worth keeping an eye on. So with that, thank you for coming. All right. Uh, thank you. So we have time for one or two questions. Anybody? None? All right, thank you again, Brett. Thanks. Thank you.